You're listening to a Roddenberry Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to Engage. Here we are with another week and more of your comments and questions. I'm John Champion. And I'm Norman Lau. And uh, this is what we do. You know the score. You send mm-hmm. us comments. We answer them. Well, not always, you know, in email form or written, but this, like this, having a conversation, which I really prefer. So yeah, yeah. it's a lot easier than texting or emailing or answering like with two thumbs and a screen. Right, right. <laughs> right. Because what, what you lose is nuance very often. And in this, you know, it, we actually think through, talk through an idea and and you can uh, get a better sense of our feelings on a topic. So um yeah, so we've picked out some great ones uh, as we do every week, and uh, we're going to kick it off today ooh, with uh, an email from Joe. So, okay. um, tell you what, I will. Uh, ooh, all right. So, th- this is actually a, a section of a longer email from Joe, and he's talking about uh, Voyager season one, episode two, Parallax. But I just wanted to pull this chunk. All right. Okay. So, mm-hmm. here we go. Email from Joe. I think the overall message of the episode is about prejudice. Janeway has prejudice against the Maquis crew, believing that not all of them can be trusted or depended upon. I think that when she made Chakotay her first officer, she thought that's all she would have to do to gain their trust and solidify them as one crew. She was clearly wrong about that. I also like how, in the end, it's intelligence that breaks through Janeway's prejudice. Her interaction with Balana on an intellectual level, both in solving the problem they are in and with their discussion on the shuttle, eventually turns her original ideas over. I think also that the Maquis are prejudiced against the Federation. As soon as one incident breaks out, they're ready to mutiny because they don't trust the Starfleet system to take care of them. There is also, of course, prejudice against the Doctor for his lack of flesh and blood humanity. Kess is the one uh, to start making headway in his acceptance due to her lack of experience and naivete. She doesn't understand the concept of a holographic person. She just sees a person who has a personality and is unique from everyone else. Her mind isn't thinking about his actions being controlled by computer algorithms, and she doesn't prejudge him to be anything but real. I think that this prejudice theme will become one of the major themes in this show as we progress. Things are not always what they appear to be, and it isn't right to judge people simply because they belong to some category that you've already formed an opinion on. A lesson many people today need to learn, by the way. It's very nice. That's a great observation, yeah. That is a great observation. And like I said, Mm -hmm. it's just a chunk of a longer email that Joe sent. Um, Yeah, any any, uh, specific uh, take on that, Norm? Well, I mean, I think that Joe's like in the ballpark here. I mean, certainly in Parallax, we see that Janeway has a very, uh, very Starfleet Federation type of way of looking at the overall structure of her organization. She sees the ship as an organization and an organization in order to function properly, in this case, in order to get them safely back home within 75 years or 70,000 light years. Yeah. Obviously, that's of paramount importance, and she has to be able to make great strides in trust to be able to do that. Now, the interesting thing I like uh, in in Joe's observation with Chakotay is that as long as you buy into the token Maquis, then he can keep all the other Maquis in line, which is, I think, uh, you know, it's a great observation because these Maquis, they're independent thinkers. They think about not only how they're serving their own purpose, but they're not Starfleet, so they don't have to tow the Starfleet line. They don't have to tow the philosophy of going out there and seeking out strange new worlds and new civilizations and boldly going. No, they want to get home. They want to live. They want to be able to serve themselves and their own interests. But at the same time, though, I think that the line of, I think also that the Maquis are prejudiced against the Federation. I mean, you can you can take that generalization mm-hmm. into account, but I don't think that's necessarily fair when you see Seska and the other one, the other officers say, we're with you. Maybe they all aren't. You know, maybe like as in like all Starfleet aren't prejudiced against all Maquis. I think the, the interesting thing about this episode is that you're seeing things from a very individualized basis. Yeah. Well, and, and I think what's so cool about all of this discussion is, is about kind of the context around all of it. You know, I, I've always felt like it's been a misnomer to say that, okay, Star Trek's future utopia is perfect because we have solved all of these problems. Like, yes, we are always striving toward being better, but even, look, even Captain Kirk in Star Trek VI, controversially, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. he has this prejudice about Klingons that comes 
boiling to the surface because A, it's a lifetime of his lived experience, and it is also the very specific circumstance of what happened to his son. So mm -hmm. circumstances are always evolving and circumstances may dictate how one feels in a particular time. So you've got the Maquis being in the, their very specific circumstance. You have Starfleet, uh, Starfleet crew being uh, raised and trained in a certain way, but then the circumstance changes again. And now they find themselves completely away from home, having to work together. Does it always take that? Does it always take these extreme circumstances to break down those walls? Well, you hope that even if people come with prejudgments, that they allow the you know angels of their better nature to take over and realize, oh, wait, but Starfleet and our own system of values and morals compels us to look beyond that. Sometimes those circumstances are too difficult to get through, uh, but sometimes we get to sort of check ourselves again, recheck where we are, and actually be better. There's a question I wanted to ask you, and, and maybe this can be uh, addressed by everyone who's listening. So in Star Trek, the Enterprise, the Enterprise A, the Enterprise D, the Enterprise C, for all intents and purposes, the Enterprise B, all the lettered enterprises, just <laughs> pretty much anyone with the name Enterprise, any oh, ship. Right. The, the legacy of that name, Enterprise, it, it constitutes the best and the finest crew, the best and the finest that Starfleet has to offer. And I'm not saying this to cast shade on Voyager or to slight Voyager in any way, but Voyager mm -hmm. is not the Enterprise, hmm. meaning that the crew of Voyager, not it doesn't necessarily represent the pinnacle of Starfleet training. Hmm. It was just a ship mm -hmm. that was supposed to do a certain job for a certain reason. It's not out there as the flagship of the Federation. So crew. that means that yeah. you're going to have crew there that aren't necessarily the best of the best representing the best of the Federation's ideals. Well, you know, but I would look at it this way. It, it, it's not the flagship. Therefore, maybe you don't have this handpicked crew that is representative of the best values of the Federation, but they're all still citizens of the Federation. They are all still Starfleet, mm -hmm. with the exception of the Maquis who are there, but even some of them came up through Starfleet. So that Starfleet training, that, that, that Starfleet, um, well, for lack of a better word, indoctrination, <laughs> said in the most positive sense here, um, should have rubbed off on them at you know, to some extent, look back at the Enterprise, look at the Enterprise D for that matter. Um, not everybody on board is a Starfleet officer. Remember, you got families and you, you've you got uh, presumably just citizens who are there for research purposes, for other reasons. Are they necessarily held to the same very high standards that the crew of the flagship uh, are held to? Or is it because we're sort of all on the same page with Federation ideals, Starfleet ideals, that's still why we're there. We we still push ourselves to live up to that. Although so. those families on the D, you know, they don't, they're not in command level decision making processes. You know, like say Chakotay is. Chakotay, by all intents and purposes, mm -hmm. is really straddling both universes because he actively is Maquis, but actively was Starfleet at one point in time. So I I, I can yeah. understand like why, say, not every single officer on Voyager, like uh, engineer Carey was putting his best foot forward with dealing with, say, someone like Bellana. Sure. Right? Sure. Would, would uh, say, Jordy, well, that's not fair because he, well, hey, he was engineer, <laughs> or, or, or Miles or Scotty, yeah. right? Or Trip. Yeah. Like any of the engineers, de facto, would they have handled things differently because they were the best on yeah. the best ship? Yeah. But, but again, the, there you are with circumstance again. Like you're on sure. the best ship versus something else. Like how how challenged do they get? And well, that, that's where you either show like DS9, like how challenging does it get when you're in the least optimal circumstance? Uh, sure. Joe, thank you so much for this uh, very provocative email and your comments. And uh, you know, if you listening out there would like to join us, well, you know what to do, subscribe to this playlist, Mission Log Engage at the Roddenberry Prod YouTube channel. Send us your comments, missionlog at roddenberry.com. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at missionlogpod. And remember, we may engage with your comments on the air.